Hi, I'm James McGuire, and on today's eSpeaks, we're talking about a programming model that leverages machine learning and conversational AI to turn simple English prompts into executable code. Pretty cool idea. To discuss that, I'm joined by Silvio Savarese, Chief Scientist at Salesforce. Silvio, very good to have you with us today. Very nice uh, uh, talking to you, James. So I think there is, it's fascinating because there's so much going on in the world of conversational AI these days. I mean, the, the ability for machines to understand, understand spoken language, it's really changing the nature of you know, human-machine relationship. What do you see as a couple of, of key trends driving this sector in 2022? What, what, what's going on out there that we should know about? Uh, yes. Uh, well, James, uh, I think that um, the, the reality is that we live in a complex society. And uh, uh, you know today's technology innovations offer really amazing capabilities to users, to customers, uh, to consumers. Uh, but then these capabilities come at the cost of being very difficult to operate. Uh, there is a, um, a lot of uh, requirements in terms of a lot of investment of time to learn, uh, to deploy, and uh, to update. And uh, we believe that our, our work on uh, uh, helping developers through uh, our uh, projects can uh, be a, a, a significant step toward uh, that effort. Do you see, uh, I mean, are, are companies struggling with this idea of, of spoken language and, and using it to drive code? Is this a, something they're familiar with? What is your sense of how comfortable companies are with this? Yeah, so so the, the, the reality is that um, uh, enterprise software development continues to grow uh, in complexity. Um, and uh, same time, there is a more and more uh, of our lives that depends on digital infrastructure. And also the cost of downtime is become higher and higher. So this is an ongoing effort in the company to make sure that uh, uh, there is like zero downtime. And, uh, and uh, for all these reasons, uh, we really need to develop, uh, we need to provide engineers and developers with new tools that allow to become productive at scale uh, facing all these challenges. And um, it's not really about uh, letting work faster, it's really about letting work operate at a high level. And um, so therefore, the, the, the goal of uh, our tools for code development, uh, like CodeGen or CodeP5, are really uh, addressed, um, addressing the, this challenge and allows to uh, developers to stay at the level, uh, at the right level, at the high level, and uh, uh, to really let them um, focus on the most creative and the most um, uh, you know, uh, important parts of code development and uh, be able to uh, take them off from um, uh, uh, effort which are more repetitive and uh, menial when it comes to code development. Well, I'm thinking with this kind of a system, really any person could could speak the prompts or use the prompts to create executable code. So perhaps as a salesperson, maybe there's a mid-level manager that is that is doing this. Is that Would it be used that or is it still for developers mainly? Uh, right. So uh, our um, uh, so we are targeting this uh, technology for a number of different uh, users. Uh, so first of all, we have no, the no coders, so those that don't have any technical um, background or very minimal background in coding, uh, but then they're nevertheless interested in building programs with uh, with natural language. So this is the in this case the entry point is very low, uh, and um, this is an effort actually to really democratize uh, uh, coding the coding experience. Uh, then we have a second category, which is called the low coders. So these are uh, administrators, IT specialists. They want to upgrade and accelerate their coding skills uh, to close the gap uh, with the more uh, with their more advanced peers. And uh, in this case, CodeGen and our software can really help uh, generating code solution that can be uh, used to plug um, into the in existing infrastructure and help those uh, individuals, those, op those professionals, to integrate. Um, to integrate the code that is generated using our software into an existing infrastructure. And therefore, really help them boost up their coding skills uh, and provide more customized uh, examples. And then the last category is the expert coders, those that already are very familiar with the, with the, with the old coding environments and uh, really would like to use uh, our tools to automate um, the repetitive, to replace the repetitive and um, inefficient uses of their time. So in this case, it's really targeting uh, those uh, skills that are related to uh, problem solving, uh, design, verification, architecture, which are the most uh, interesting parts for more an expert coder. Fascinating. I, I think you, you touched upon a really interesting idea, the idea of democratizing coding. And really, I think the idea of 
uh, democratizing technology is sort of a big mega mega trend that is going on now. Right. This really does democratize software development in a pretty profound way. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, it's really making helping making uh, coding more inclusive and uh, allow allowing uh, allowing uh, no coders to uh, benefits from the power of customization and personalization. In fact, you know it's interesting because uh, in uh, one current trend is to really uh, lowering the bar for using many tools, not just for coding, but also for many other kind mm -hmm. of software. Uh, however, the uh, the caveat of those tools is that uh, they also um, uh, they tend to be less uh, personalized. They be less uh, able to provide uh, a customized or personalized effort. So kind of you know they come up with a boilerplate result, which is not uh, necessarily what the, uh, those users are looking for. So these um, type of tools are allows us to um, create a win-win situations. When on a, on the one end they empower uh, no coder with a lot of capabilities but also creating very, very low entry point. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, all right, say there's a company out there that wants to deploy more low code or, and or a conversational AI. Uh, what advice would you give them? How, how would they get started or how would they expand their current deployment? Yeah, so, um, uh, so, uh, so that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Um, so first of all, I would like to reassure uh, developers that uh, these tools are uh, used to serve and empower them, not to replace them. I think that's the first thing. Right. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that reassurance might be important to say. Right. Yeah, I think it's a very important and our mission, not just for this particular area of work, but also for our entire mission of uh, as an AI research organization focusing on AI, we really want to provide solutions that can uh, help uh, empower users and customers and um, uh, as opposed to provide solution can replace you know, uh, professionals. So our goal is to integrate AI with the existing uh, skills um, and uh, give them you know, those kind of boosted uh, opportunities to, uh, to be more efficient, to be more productive. So having said that, um, uh, it's, uh, it, so then I, I want to make sure that um, professionals do, do know that uh, uh, it's important that these tools are useful for empowering those skills. Um, uh, also, uh, another important aspect is that as, as these tools become available, uh, we shouldn't lower the attention level and uh, make sure that uh, those uh, tools are bias-free, inclusive, and trusted. This mm -hmm. is a very important aspect when it comes to using injecting AI uh, into you know into different uh, um, areas of um, industry, uh, enterprise, and uh, uh, those uh, modern models uh, are the risk are at the risk of being. Uh, biased, and this really depends on how uh, the data, the training phase is done, how the kind of data is is, uh, is included into the training part. Um, so it's critical that uh, those professionals are paying attention and making sure that those models again are bias-free and also can be trusted, you know, uh, to to the to the customer base. Um, also, uh, it's important to treat transparency and interpretability. interpretability as a design requirement from day one, as opposed to uh, uh, adding it as an added feature. Uh, and here, actually, conversation AI can play a critical role because uh, one aspect of conversation AI is that, uh, by default, it can enable interpretations. It can enable transparency because you can actually use conversation to understand what's the under the hood uh, and uh, and therefore make the whole process much more clear to users and to the, to the end uh, users. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, I think this is, uh, you know, uh, I feel this is a, um, a common ground for not just for developers, but for any professionals uh, when it comes to understand uh, pain points and needs. We need to make sure that we have an open dialogue and understand what are the pain points of developers, understand what, what their needs, and uh, AI should be aligned to those needs as opposed to you know, come up with <laughs> amazing ideas, but then you know, they, they cannot necessarily find um, echo to the other side. Right, I definitely I would say so. So let's drill down into the, the Salesforce product. I know you've mentioned it, CodeGen. How does CodeGen help companies? Or what, what's the advantage of CodeGen? Yeah, the advantage of CodeGen is that uh, it's, um, okay, let me, let, first of all, uh, let me uh, tell you a little bit, um, again, how uh, CodeGen, CodeGen works. Please. So, um, so CodeGen is, um, is a tool uh, that uh, uses language to um, create code. Um, and um, it's uh, you can use natural language. You can use you can actually say what you want, 
uh, and uh, CodeGen um, will produce code to implement that idea. Uh, so this is a, a very important uh, concept because again, as I mentioned earlier, it allows to lower the bar to uh, start uh, developing uh, code at, um, for those that don't, are not necessarily proficient with coding. Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, the idea of CodeGen is that you can uh, exp exp explain what the user wants uh, through a conversation. So even if uh, the output of the prompt is not necessarily what the user is looking for, uh, there is an ensuing conversation that helps uh, fine tune uh, the output. So fine tune what the, the developer is looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so this conversational part is very important for a number of reasons. Uh, first, first of all, uh, that uh, enables uh, personalizations because as there is a conversation, the cogen can produce something which is closer, closer to the developer intentions. Um, can I interrupt you on that one? It's an interesting idea about personalizations. Does that mean that the, I mean, assuming since the system is built on artificial intelligence, it improves over time. So maybe its ability to create personalizations would also improve over time. Right, it's uh, it's uh, right. Improve personalization over time in two in two ways. First of all, it's uh, you would um, by having this conversation, you would uh, get to understand user intention more and more, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a much finer uh, grain, in, in more details. But also, it would be as uh, the AI tool is is um, um, tend to work with a specific user, it would actually uh, start understanding. It would start understanding user intention, user um uh, expectations and then you can get a level of personalization that is aligned with that particular user as opposed to another user that might have different needs mm -hmm. so there's two types of personalization one is uh you know iterating through the conversation second is about learning the 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 needs of a particular user as opposed to others mm -hmm. well let's look let's look to the future of of, of low code and or conversational ai i think this is going to be a very big area in the years ahead i would call it even explosive growth. What are some key milestones we can, we can look for in the years ahead? Yeah, so it's, um, what, when I think about the future of this technology, uh, there is a number of things that I very much excited. Uh, uh, first of all, um, be able to uh, uh, better understand and predict um, user intentions. I think right now, uh, there is a bit of a lack in terms of how AI can, uh, can uh, able to uh, uh, really understand um, the context and uh, the situations of certain uh, work environment. Uh, and this is related to another important aspect, which is uh, how to learn to orchestrate and operationalize, operationalize various aspects of a complex project. Uh, so uh, CodeGen and Code T5, other software tend to be focusing on a specific problem, uh, but in, in reality, um, when it comes to developing complex code, uh, we are looking at uh, much more complex projects where there are different com uh, components that to be orchestrated and is to be connected. Uh, therefore, there's a need for really operated, uh, expanding the scope and the, the field of view of current projects into injecting more situational, situational awareness and contextual reasoning. Um, another aspect is also important about how to um, um, have, um, make sure that those uh, AI agents uh, six guidance when there is a situation of uncertainty. And this is actually a very uh, common problem in AI right now is that those systems tend to come up with mistakes with a lot of confidence, right? Uh, so it is a bit of a philosophical concept here. Uh, so we, uh, they have to know that they don't know, right? They have to be aware that a, a certain output, certain uh, insight might not be uh, might done with low, low confidence. So it's important to uh, again, this kind of uh, confidence in uh, um, and seeking advice, seeking help if uh, the, the AI system doesn't know how to answer uh, a question. Uh, again, conversational idea can be extremely helpful because you can use conversation to fine tune and get more clarity on a specific question that the AI is not able to address. And also uh, another aspect I mentioned earlier is about uh, injecting ethical principles. So make sure mm. that uh, we're still investing on on uh, on tools that allows us to come up with output which are unbiased, which are trustable, can be trusted. Uh, they can address diversity diversity of users. Uh, they can be transparent. They can be explained. Um, I also want to mention that uh, something that uh, those tools don't do well. Uh, first of all, they don't invent new stuff. So they they uh, 
it's it will be impossible for these softwares to come up with a new algorithm. So if you ask how to make let's make my the database of my company run faster, well then th this is not the right tool. So it, it cannot come up with a new <laughs> brand new uh, algorithm. Uh, so this is still at the at the um, uh, the court. Uh, at the level of developers, which has to use their imagination to understand context, understand uh, how to solve this problem in a more effective way. Um, again, it's uh, we are looking for tools that are augmenting you, must not replace them. Mm -hmm. I think that last point is really fascinating. You talked about the idea the system cannot invent new things, and of course, that's that's still the area for the human brain to be in charge of. That we we can't look to AI algorithms to do that. And yet they will improve existing systems, the systems that they themselves are, are running or supporting will will be support will improve as the algorithm takes more and more and more data. Uh, maybe at some point there's going to be a point where the system can be improved surprisingly by the AI or is that am I looking too far ahead. Yeah so uh, systems can uh, uh, definitely can improve a lot uh, using AI. Um, uh, I have to say that the current AI technology don't uh, again doesn't uh, able to perform this kind of task of creating a new algorithm from scratch. Um, but definitely, you know, as, as the technology advances, uh, we might be able to make progress toward toward the directions. Uh, I think it's important for us, uh, for technologists, from AI specialists to, to think about, um, to have a bit of a humanistic way of using, humanistic way of using AI in a sense of making sure that, again, AI is used uh, as a, as a service for, for, for users, for developers, for, for uh, operators, as supposed to, uh, as a tool can be potentially uh, you know, threat, threaten their existence. At the same time also, I think it's important that uh, developer operators do learn uh, how to um, operate those AI tools. It's actually, there is a learning curve. Uh, it's a bit like you, know, you, you, you give access a new transportation system. Let's say you know you don't have a car. All of a sudden, you have cars, right? Then people have to use how to in order to make best advantage of a car. Uh, you have to use how to have to learn how to use it, right? How to make mm -hmm. the best use of it. Uh, it's not that car are replacing legs, but you know they can really empower humans in, in doing things they couldn't do before. But there is a learning curve. Here mm -hmm. the same. So we need to invest on make sure that um, the future developers, the future users, the future operators do know how to use uh, AI to can make the best use of those tools. Silvio, mm -hmm. I think you said it. It's a fascinating stuff. It's going to be a very interesting sector to follow in the years ahead. Thanks for sharing your insight today. Well, thank you so much, James, and I'll be happy to answer more questions in the future you have. So.